It can be picturesque, peaceful. If you really want to enjoy living in Maine, you have to like to do something outdoors. Or dangerously intense. 24 inches came down in a fell swoop. And we're taking you through it all. From the cities to the trails to the mountains. Obviously challenging conditions, but, you know, uh, very rewarding. Tonight, see why winter in Maine is so unique. From Newry, in the heart of Maine's western mountains. From WMTW, Maine's total weather. This is Winter in Maine, a total forecast. Winter is just around the corner. Tonight, we'll take a total look at what makes it so great and challenging. We'll follow a snowmaking crew up the mountain and see what it's like to play Mother Nature. We'll examine one of the most damaging winter elements, ice, and explain the difference between sleet and freezing rain. And if you're wondering if this winter will be like last winter, you won't want to miss our exclusive winter outlook. Welcome to Winter in Maine, a total forecast. Before we look forward, let's look back at last year. From record setting cold to a historic blizzard, last winter will be remembered for a long time. I love Maine, I love the winter, but this winter uh, makes you question it. That was mid February. By then, the cabin fever was already setting in. That's because winter started early last year, with our first snowfall coming on November 3rd, nearly three weeks ahead of schedule. With all the wind and stuff, my husband noticed the line in our backyard was in the snow. <laughs> Just three weeks later, an unusual spin to our Thanksgiving holiday. Grocery stores packed with people, not only shopping for their holiday feast, but preparing for a winter storm. Travelers getting out of town early. The storm knocked out power to thousands. Stamford, Connecticut. My brother's picking me up for Thanksgiving. Then December, which would turn out to be one of the warmest on record. All of the November snow melted by Christmas Day, which, by the way, was a balmy 53 degrees. By early January, many parts of southern Maine were brown instead of white. Skiers and snowmobilers all wishing for snow. We're looking at a very sad sight. But it wouldn't stay that way for long. A full-scale blizzard brought nearly two feet of snow to southern Maine on January 27th and into the 28th. Strong winds, frigid temperatures, it made it feel downright brutal. WMTW stayed on the air non-stop for 15 straight hours. Uh, this snowbank was just a little mile when we got here this morning. The snowy pattern continued unabated through February. In fact, from January 24th to February 25th, Portland never went more than two days without measurable snowfall. A snow squall on I-95 in Carmel led to a massive pileup. 75 vehicles involved, the worst in state history. And it was also brutally cold, the coldest February on record. The average temperature, 13.8 degrees, nearly 12 degrees below normal, a new record. 22 days in a row, we never got above freezing, also a new record. The snowstorms finally eased in March, but the cold and snowpack stuck around. With opening day a little over a month away, the Portland Sea Dogs brought in some heavy equipment to clear the field and also made a promise, free tickets if they didn't play ball on opening day. Things were looking good until April 9th. Unfortunately, we're going to have to postpone opening day and go for it again tomorrow night. A few inches of wet snow meant no baseball. Luckily, it happened to be our last snowstorm of the season, an amazing 157 days after the first snowfall of the winter. It certainly was a winter to remember. Coming up a little bit later in the program, we'll dig up some of the other past storms as we look back on some of Maine's notorious winters. Maine has two distinct geographical features, the coast and the mountains. It's the reason why you may see rain at your home in Freeport, while at the same time, your friend is seeing snow in Norway. Forecasting for Maine can be hard and inconsistent, especially as we transition into and out of winter. And here's why. It's the ocean. As we begin the winter season, ocean temperatures are relatively warm in the 40s. As storm systems approach, any onshore wind transports that warm air inland. Therefore, while it may be snowing in the mountains in the capital district, many coastal areas are above freezing and seeing rain. On the flip side, early spring brings large temperature ranges during early warm-ups. Ocean temperatures remain cool in the upper 30s or 40s, and any onshore breeze transports that cool ocean air inland. 
Therefore, as we're forecasting above average temperatures in the 60s and 70s inland, a sea breeze keeps the coastline in the 40s and 50s, allowing that winter chill to hang on just a bit longer. Usually, if you want to find snow on the ground this time of year, you have to head to the mountains and probably to one of Maine's many ski areas. Without the snowmaking crews, it would be virtually impossible to make early season turns this time of year. And it's not easy work. Courtney Sturgeon rides along and shows us what it takes for these crews to make the snow fly at Sunday River. You kind of come in in the morning and wake up with the mountain. They work 12 hour shifts at over 3,000 feet in freezing temperatures and high winds. We have a very intimate relationship with Mother Nature. A crew of nearly 50 people dedicated to winter and making snow. Meet the snowmakers at one of Maine's largest and most popular ski resorts, Sunday River. Where there's some kind of mountain of white sticking up in the gray and the brown. So. It's the job of Nathaniel Shedd and his fellow snowmakers to prepare the slopes for guests each fall when the mountain opens for business. But when snow isn't in the forecast, the snowmakers get to work making it themselves. Even at night, the crews are making their way up the chairlift to make sure there's snow for the next day's skiers. You can hear the snow blowing on the slopes below, but if you look out, there's nothing but darkness. And it all begins here in the break room, where each shift hands off a day's work to the next crew. It's keeping all this stuff going. It's planning where we're making the snow. The planning stage starts in the summer months and involves coordinating the maintenance of more than 100 miles of pipes. Craig Richard has been a snowmaker for six years and admits it's still hard to describe how all of this creates all of this. You can tell people all you want, but nothing explains what actually goes on out there. The title of snowmaker is earned when one masters pumping water and compressed air into 5,000 underground hydrants spread across the side of the mountain. So all the water comes out of the hydrants. We control the hydrants. That goes through the gun. The gun does the thing. Easy enough, right? If you can read numbers on a gauge, you can pretty much do it. But to those in the driver's seat for the first time, it can be a big responsibility to oversee the safety and progress of the whole team. Uh, how are we doing for water? We're maxed out right now. Ian McCluskey is training a new snowmaker to run the pump room, the heart of the operation. It's here snowmakers work out the perfect formula of water and compressed air to deliver to the slopes. Meanwhile, at a building that sounds like it's right down Santa Claus Lane, the Snowflake factory houses massive compressors that build up enough pressure to push the air all the way up to the top of a mountain. But having the right equipment means nothing without the perfect conditions. While you might think this job may seem impossible or even downright unnatural, these snowmakers have made it their mission to share what they love most, winter. And then sort of spread that out across the mountain for everybody else. It's, it's so satisfying. For WMTW News 8, I'm Courtney Sturgeon. When the snow flies this winter, Maine's Department of Transportation will have some new innovative snow tools at their disposal. Jim Keithley shows us how these tools will not only save us money, but keep you safe. The department has recently purchased eight of these brand new salt trucks, but the initial investment is costly at nearly a quarter of a million dollars a piece. But with the newer technologies inside these vehicles, designed to save money down the road. Inside the cab, newer technology such as ground speed control. It's a computer program that shows precisely how much salt is going out on a given stretch of road. Very cost effective. Now we can track the cost. We know what each truck's putting out for material. That's a big thing. This truck might only put out 10 tons of salt in the storm. We know how much it costs. We know how many trips he makes. It's all recorded. Now we know how much we're putting on the road. We never knew how much it was used to be. Put out whatever it took to make it work. Put out another load of sand. It didn't matter. You know, we didn't have that technology. Now we know. In the garage, new high-performance plow blades are waiting to be installed. And check out these underbody scrapers, another piece of new technology. They put those down, it scrapes a lot better than the front plows do, which uses less material. So you saving salt that way, too, is using a little bit less salt because we're scraping more snow and ice off the road. At the Scarborough DOT, 66 trucks are ready to go, better equipped to tackle another main winter. That was Jim Keithley reporting. Snow removal technology has come a long way over the years. 
Just look at how it was done 70 years ago. The Maine Historical Society found this film of snow removal operations that was shot around 1940. You can see how they used conveyor belt loaders to remove the snow from downtown Portland. Unlike today, all of that snow was dumped into the Four River back then. And also, unlike today, much of that work was done by hand. We have the video plus many of the other features you're seeing tonight at your fingertips, both on the News 8 mobile app and on WMTW.com. Now to the place you call home. Norm Carcos has taken us all over the state in his hometown Maine series. Now he takes us to some of the Maine towns that take winter to a new level. We're here in Augusta. When you think of the state's capital, well, dog sledding may not be the first thing that comes to mind unless you happen to travel to the Haywood Kennels, where those dogs love to run. It was a big decision. A lot of people said, why on earth are you moving sled dogs to Augusta, Maine? <laughs> Knowing the trails and this lovely property that came up for rent from our best friends and helpers up there, um, it was just a perfect decision. It was an easy one. Today, Haywood Kennel Sled Dog Adventures is home to 35 Alaskan Huskies who are just chomping at the bit to run through Mother Nature's early season offering. So, now, part of visiting the kennel is giving the riders that full experience of dog sledding. Um, we t introduce them to the team, and then we have um, hooking them up, and they learn how to harness. And we hook up the team, and off we go for a ride out into the beautiful fields. And then they come back, and they take care of the dog. <laughs> Yeah, it was so cool. It was awesome. The kennel attracts other local mushers who volunteer their time to make sure that their guests are getting that same wow factor while sledding through a winter wonderland in Augusta. Our next stop is Bethel. Now, while most towns try to get rid of the snow, residents there say the more the better. If you are complaining about snow, you should come to Bethel because that is where snow is fun. What lakes and beaches are to Maine towns in the summer, snow and mountains are to this town in the winter. And lots of skiing, lots of snowmobiling, um, cross country skiing, ice fishing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So people here look forward to snow and they want it to last a long time and we love it. While all this is in Bethel's backyard, thousands of tourists continue to travel hours to reach this winter wonderland destination. We're big skiers. We're always up at Sunday River, and today there, there was a very cold wind chill, so we decided to try something a little different. Uh -huh. So, what did we decide to do today, guys? Cross country skiing. Cross country skiing. For the first time? Yes. yes. Oh. Bethel has also laid claim to being home of the world's largest snow people. Angus, the Snow King, which stood nearly 114 feet tall back in 1999, and most recently in 2008, the 122 foot tall Olympia Snow Woman. And finally, if you're looking to find one of the most unique horse drawn sleigh rides in all of Maine, you'll have to travel to the Highview Farm in Harrison. From the time we started using our horses, we rigged up a sleigh, those first ones, when they were about three, and just went for a family sleigh ride. And then uh, went for more family sleigh rides, and then friends wanted to go. And for the last 15 years, Bill and Darcy have been taking people from all over the world on these nostalgic sleigh rides. You know, we have people come from Texas or Florida or Georgia or is Israel that have never, you know, they've never seen snow or be able to en enjoy it. <laughs> Bill and Darcy own five Belgian horses and say they are the perfect breed for a sleigh ride. So they make a good uh, sleigh ride horse. Uh, they're not high spirited. They're just a good work horse. I think the the prettiest breed too. <laughs> Very photogenic. There is something to be said about a sleigh ride in Maine. Maybe it's watching these massive horses gallop through a fresh coat of snow, hearing the jingling of the sleigh bells, or smelling that crisp country air. Thanks, Norm. Much more is on the way on tonight's program. Coming up. There's a lot of talk about El Nino this year. We'll show you what it is and how it could affect the type of weather we see this winter. Yay! But first, some main winter facts. It's 32 degrees, but your favorite ski area isn't making snow. That's because ideal snowmaking conditions are dry and cold. In fact, 28 degrees or colder is considered ideal. This is Winter in Maine, a total forecast, and we'll be right back. From WMTW, Maine's Total Weather, Winter in Maine, a total forecast continues. You've probably heard a lot about El Nino lately, and you might be wondering if it'll be a factor in this winter's weather. Let's take a closer look at what El Nino is 
how it will be a significant factor this winter. Simply put, El Nino is a rise in the seawater temperature of the tropical Pacific Ocean. It's a naturally occurring event, happening every two to seven years and lasting from nine months to as long as two years. Scientists are now developing a good understanding of how it forms. Trade winds usually blow east to west over the tropical Pacific Ocean. This pushes warm water westward and allows cooler water to replace it. So normal is warm in the west and cool in the east. But with an El Nino, the trade winds weaken or even reverse and the warm water slumps back to the east, warming the east and keeping the cooler water to the west. This winter, the warming is significant and may end up being the strongest El Nino ever. The impact will be felt from coast to coast. In the west, odds favor beneficial rains helping to ease the severe drought. Rainy and cool conditions are almost a certainty along the Gulf Coast, with rare midwinter severe weather a possibility too. Closer to home, El Nino years have produced some of the biggest snowstorms along the east coast, as that extra warmth is extra fuel in the jet stream. But too much warming can also lead to more rain than snow. The strength of the El Nino is critical. And finally, the combination of extra warm air and typical winter Arctic air can lead to massive ice storms, something that many Mainers recall. And yes, 1998 was an El Nino year. Now that we know what El Nino is, we'll take that information and factor it into our total winter forecast. That is coming up a little bit later in the show. As you can see, a lot goes into forecasting a winter storm. And getting a total forecast doesn't end with what you see on TV. Our total weather app gives you everything you need to know so you can plan your day around the winter weather. You'll always see the latest video forecast, and interactive radar lets you see exactly where the storm is at any time of the day. From tourism to recreation, winter generates millions for the state and for many local businesses. But when it comes to our roads, the season costs a lot of cold, hard cash, too. Megan Torgerson takes a closer look. Nearly every square inch of Shaker Hill Outdoors retail space is accounted for. I've never had it this full. Now with tens of thousands of dollars more in inventory and new products and product lines, Tim Warren is hoping for a repeat of last winter. Every facet of, of Shaker Hill is based on weather. After all, Warren knows his bottom line is all about the elements. Last winter was about 30% better than the winter before. A similar story for our winter tourism numbers. According to the main office of tourism, the state saw a 4% increase in visitors during the 2014-2015 winter season, largely overnight visitors. More visitors mean more money. Overnight visitors on average spent $864 per party. Mainers and tourists alike spend a lot of money in winter, but it also costs a lot of money. Just ask the folks here at Westbrook Public Services. This guy, a new sidewalk plow, 120 grand. And we clear anywhere from uh, 20, 25 to 30 miles of sidewalk a, a storm in the city. A big job with a big price tag. Artie Ledoux says in all, Westbrook spent more than $577,000 cleaning and clearing roads and sidewalks. This year, as with last year, Ledoux says overtime makes up 80 to 85 percent of the budget. It's, it's expensive, you know. Just how expensive? Last year, the overtime budget was over only by about 900 bucks, according to Ledoux. What it will be this year, only Mother Nature knows. Megan Torgeson, WMTW News 8. There are lots of ways to keep our homes and businesses warm. And over the past decade, pellet stoves have become a popular choice. Kyle Jones takes us along and shows us how they work and how the technology is helping our local economy. And lots of people like pellet stoves. They do a really nice job heating relatively small areas. Boilers, on the other hand, are automatic devices that generally live in the basement. And they heat your entire home. Dutch Dresser of Maine Energy System showed us how it works. This is the computer that does the work. So this tells the boiler what the temperature is like outdoors, what the temperature is like in the boiler vessel. The water is heated in the unit. The temperature in there will approach 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And like a traditional boiler heating system, it's fully automated. The pellets are delivered the same as oil, and the cost is about equal, while oil prices are still low. Unlike oil, the price of pellets have been the same for about 10 years. So that stability in pricing is what our customers are banking on for their own personal economics. 
B.J. Otten is COO of Maine Energy Systems and says most of the pellets are locally sourced at mills. We know that the dollars that we spend on this specific type of fuel um, stay in the local economy. Using an indigenous fuel and keeping those dollars rolling around helps everybody. Efficiency Maine has up to $5,000 in rebates for pellet boilers and furnaces. Other groups like the Northern Forest Center have them too. In Farmington and Wilton we have two or three um, residential incentives. And in anywhere in Franklin and Oxford counties, we have larger incentives for non-residential projects. That was Kyle Jones with a story. And coming up later in the show, we'll show you a device that keeps our homes warm and toasty. And it's made right here in Maine. Winter can be a lot of fun, but it can also be dangerous if you're not well prepared. Tracy Sable caught up with a medical expert who explains how to stay safe when old man winter hits. I think um, the most important thing to remember is when winter's coming, we have to be prepared. Dr. Sheila Panette is the former head of the Maine CDC. She says being prepared in part means having the proper gear. Get things that are water repellent, uh, wind resistant, uh, things that are light and so that you can move easily, but at the same time are warm. Use wool, use the, these uh, special types of uh, temperature resistant uh, clothing. And make sure you properly cover up the areas of your body that are most prone to getting frost. Really, the most affected areas are those that are exposed the most commonly, and that is your fingers, your nose, your ears, your um, nose, and your cheeks, and your chin. So, what are the signs and symptoms of frostbite? Well, oftentimes, in the beginning, when you, the elements are affecting your digits, usually, or your um, nose and your ears, it, you'll feel that tingling sensation and they'll start to get red. We call that frost nip. But when you get to frostbite, oftentimes your skin starts to change color. It becomes this whitish, gray, yellow color, and then it becomes waxy and firm. And then it goes on to be numb, such that you don't have sensation anymore. And that's pretty severe. But frostbite isn't the only winter weather hazard. Snow removal can also pose dangers. In fact, three Portland men ages 55, 78, and 83 died last winter while shoveling snow or using snow blowers. Not surprising since snow removal can be intense work and even tougher if you're older and out of shape. So the best thing to do, Dr. Panette says, is pay attention to your body. So if you're getting short of breath or you're feeling really winded and cold um, or you feel your heart racing, you should definitely stop. For WMTW News 8, I'm Tracy Sable. Most of us think cold and snow when it comes to winter in Maine. But do you know the difference between freezing rain and sleet? We'll examine that after the break. And later, what's in store for us this winter? You won't want to miss our total winter forecast. Before we go to the break, here's some Maine winter trivia. Rock salt is effective in melting ice when temperatures are 20 degrees or below. True or false? The answer when we come back. Before the break, we asked you true or false? Rock salt is effective in melting ice when temperatures are 20 degrees or below. The answer is false. Rock salt's effectiveness drops significantly when it reaches 25 degrees, and it's essentially useless in melting ice when it's 20 degrees or below. We all remember the notorious ice storm of 98. Hundreds of thousands of Mainers were in the dark for days. The storm showed us that when it comes to wintry precipitation, it's not snow that's the most damaging, but ice, which can fall as either sleet or freezing rain. But what's the difference? Let's take a look. Sleet, snow, freezing rain, all types of wintry precipitation, but when it comes to ice, what's the difference? Sleet is a small ice pellet, not to be confused with hail, which is associated with thunderstorms. At the cloud base, precipitation typically begins as snow or rain in a very warm atmosphere. At some point in the atmosphere, there's a layer above freezing, causing the snowflake to melt into a raindrop. Following the melt, the raindrop passes through a deep layer of below freezing temperatures, allowing the raindrop to completely refreeze into a ball of ice. Sleet can accumulate, but doesn't coat items like the more destructive freezing rain. Now, freezing rain begins in a similar way as sleet. Precipitation begins as snow or rain at the cloud base, and it falls through a layer of warm air. Shortly before hitting the surface, the raindrop enters into a shallow layer of below freezing air that continues to the ground. However, there isn't enough time for the raindrop to completely refreeze. Therefore, it freezes on contact with roads, trees, power lines, and more. 
Freezing rain is the main culprit for devastating ice storms. And as we found out in 2013 and 1998, massive power outages can occur from significant ice accretion. Getting your kids to unplug and go outside can be a tough task, especially in the winter time. But there's one group working to change all that, getting the kids stoked to play in the snow. This is the fourth annual License to Chill. It's our first time at Port City Music Hall, and we have Running with Scissors, an improv comedy group. This is one of many fundraising events put on by Winter Kids, an organization that helps to get kids outdoors during the winter months when they tend to be cooped up. Winter Kids raises hundreds and thousands of dollars to get thousands of kids outdoors during those winter months when the weather can be harsh, but there's plenty of snow and ice to be enjoyed. This is one of their events throughout the year, License to Chill. However, one of their bigger events coming up is Downhill 24. It's every March, and this March is their fourth annual, and for the first time ever, Sugarloaf will be under the lights for skiers and snowboarders raising money to get kids outdoors, winter kids in the making. There's much more to come tonight. Mallory takes a look at how utility crews stay ready for the next big storm and what it takes to keep us out of the dark. And Sarah shows us some of the easy ways you can save a good chunk of money on your heating bill by winterizing your home. This is Winter in Maine, a total forecast. We'll be right back. Winter in Maine, a total forecast continues. Welcome back. I'm WMTW News 8's Chief Meteorologist Roger Griswold. Earlier in the show, we took a look back at last winter. All of its blizzards, cold snaps, and April snowstorms. We also saw the grueling work that goes into making that early season snow at Maine ski resorts. And how do the mountains and the coastline impact the weather we see during the winter? We showed you that as well. If you missed any of those stories, you'll soon be able to watch those features, plus the entire program on our News 8 mobile app, as well as WMTW.com. We've still got a lot to go through in our next half hour. We'll catch up with one of our total weather spotters who takes advantage of our four seasons to capture nature at its finest. Also, a favorite here at WMTW, Sarah Long's journey to the top of Mount Washington. And if you're wondering if this winter will be as bad as last winter, don't miss our total winter forecast coming up later tonight. But first, there have been some memorable storms over the years. Some of those storms are frozen in time, in our memories, and in pictures. Jim Keithley takes a look back through Maine's weather history. The windswept snowstorm of 1952. The snow was up to about here. To the blizzard of 69. 24 inches came down in a fell swoop. To an ice storm that hit Portland in 1886. Maine has had its share of historic storms over the years, and many of them are captured on film, transferred to microfiche, and are now treasures being stored on computers. Hidden gems, the stories behind the storms, uncovered at the Portland Room inside the Portland Public Library downtown. Abraham Schnechter is an archivist. He shows us some of the images of the storms a half a century ago. People are still talking about them today. It's a frozen moment. We even see what the buses looked like back then. We can see what businesses were in these buildings back then. It's, it's a frozen mo moment. It's a slice of time. The newspaper printed huge special editions that have become keepsakes for those who lived through the most severe storms on record. Oh yeah, that's a great shot. John Roberts treasures his copy from the kitchen of his South Portland home. Yeah, I remember going into one store where there was so much snow that they had to cut steps in the snow to get into the store because the snow was like two feet deep, packed right down, and so they cut steps in the snow so you could go into the store. That 52 storm tied this place up for a couple of weeks. He was only 11 years old during the blizzard of 52, but the memories are still fresh. It was so windblown, uh, there were drifts that were 20 feet high in places, and, and uh, we couldn't get out of our house. You couldn't get out the doors, so we went upstairs and exited the windows and got on the porch roof and, and jumped off into the snow. And the snow was up to about here. <laughs> so we had to work our way out of that place. And, and, and strange enough, the driveway was clean. The way the wind blew, the driveway was clean, but the house was buried. How is it that we're able to remember many of the details about storms so long ago? 
when something spectacular happens, some some act of nature that that uh, it, it it's such that it it stops us. It stops. It almost stops the clock. Thanks, Jim. It goes to show you Maine's been getting some pretty tough weather for a very long time. As we mentioned earlier in the show, freezing rain can cause big problems, especially when Mainers lose power. It's up to the utility companies to spring into action to get us out of the dark, but it's also up to them to stay prepared before the weather strikes. A lot of the preparation is just our ongoing maintenance also. Um, we have a, a five-year cycle trimming of all the trees. We have our uh, line inspection programs. At the first ominous forecast, CMP utilizes its relationship with other utility companies and contractors to size up the storm. Conference calls begin with local and regional authorities, and power crews from out of state and even Canada begin to mobilize. Once the storm hits, the make safe phase begins once it's safe for linemen like Sam Weber to be out. Any wire that's on the ground, uh, we actually ground it. Uh, we clear the trees, clear the roads, so uh, there's no harm to the, the, the public. The transmission system is restored before moving on to distribution, where emergency facilities come first. Hospitals, first responder type of facilities are, are high on our priority list. Um, and then we'll, we'll start methodically working through restoring the largest amount of customers as soon as possible. And the entire CMP staff may be called into their storm role. Lots of times we think about uh, field people, our line workers, our meter people, and those type of groups. But we engage all, even our corporate attorneys, all have uh, storm roles and will be activated if needed. The Christmas 2013 ice storm affected more than 140,000 CMP customers. And this is how today is going to play out. Initially thought to arrive on Sunday, the main event was on Monday. Though CMP was ready, the greatest restoration challenge was the timing. We had about 2,000 people working. And, uh, you know, it's not a small task to, to feed everybody on Christmas Day. Uh, in an event like that when a lot of the businesses are closed. The most recent significant ice storm was back in December 2013. That storm knocked out power to more than 140,000 CMP customers. We all know that winterizing your home is essential to saving money on your heating bill. Let's take a look at some basic tips on how to keep the heat in and the cold out. We've all heard the saying you have to spend money to make money, but what about spending just a little bit of money to save money, especially when it comes to winterizing your home for the cold months ahead here in Maine? Joining us today, we have Richard Burbank. He's from Evergreen Home Performance. And Richard, you're here to take a look at my house. Let's start in the basement and see what we can find. Great. Okay. There is a little bit of insulation here. I'm feeling a big draft right there. On a cold day like today is a perfect time to go around and feel. You can just feel with your hands. Right. You, you don't need special equipment. Yeah. Uh, you can just feel it and then just seal it up. One thing about windows is they're probably one of the worst insulated parts of a house, even a well-insulated house. A reversible caulking like peel and seal, yep. uh, you can seal it up temporarily uh, for, for the winter. This door, it's, it's a really nice door, but all doors leak a little bit. If we look here, um, look how there's a layer here that's not at the door itself. It's right here. Right. And I'm feeling this. It's cold down here. So you think it's the door, but it might just be the trim on the door. And if you sort it out, you could just caulk this. So, Richard, we, um, you know, a lot of people are probably thinking, oh, great, you know, fuel prices are low, and so I don't really have to worry about winterizing so much. I can turn the heat up a few degrees. Well, it certainly lowers the, the, the pressure from the panic. Right. Um, but Mainers tend to be proactive about things, and uh, the middle of the hurricane is not the time to prepare for the hurricane. Right. <laughs> so it's you heard a, it here. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, a great, it's a great time to be prepared ahead of time. Right. So you have a little extra cash flow there, and a lot of people are investing that, that lower energy cost into trying to prepare the house so that if oil prices go higher, they're, they're prepared. Winter in Maine features products made by Mainers for Mainers. As Steve Minnick shows us, some of these products may help you keep your footing, rocket down a snowy slope, or just keep warm. You know, there are some places like here at the Portland Ice Arena that don't worry about wasting heat. Most of us aren't that lucky. 
But in most homes, the wasted heat is above your head. But there's a man from South Portland who has invented a device that takes care of that. So there's a lot of hot air, you know, that's up around the ceiling. It's hot air, which Bill Zellman's thermo imaging camera shows is basically just sitting there, doing very little to heat the areas where people actually live. That heat tends to pool up there, and it's not doing you any good, and it, it's, it's wasteful. Wasteful until Zellman flips on the switch to his patented hot tube, which then redirects that hot air down to the floor and literally fans it out, creating a warm circulation. 79, 80 degrees? It's a bit of simple old-fashioned science, he says, which is made to work through modern materials. What we have today is a combination of materials, lightweight materials such as Tyvek, very efficient DC fans, maybe just the fortuitous sort of timing of events and technologies that, that allowed us to come up with something that's very lightweight. Um, anybody can hook up. You know, one of the downsides of winter is when the streets and sidewalks become as slippery as this ice. Well, there's a company out of Biddeford whose footwear is made to keep you stable. The beauty is being able to get out on days like today. Days when it's snowy, a little slippery outside, and a little extra grip will help get you where you're going. Shoes are expensive, boots are expensive, so we're offering a relatively inexpensive application for uh, traction. For 24 years now, Stable has produced a line of what it calls Stable Icers, essentially cleated pullovers which provide traction in much the same manner as a studded snow tire. When we originally started with Stable Icers, they were um, primarily used for safety purposes to keep people from falling down. And Gould founded the company, which over the past decade has shifted focus from purely safety to recreation. Today, creating a popular line of hiking, running, and walking cleats, each built to remain durable to 45 degrees below zero. Over the last 10 years or so, it's really mushroomed into the outdoor retail market for people who really want to get outside and have fun. Of course, winter is also about having fun, and nobody does fun better than Dave Nazaroff. Perhaps you've rocketed down a snowy hill on one of his handmade toboggans. A lot of old timers like myself used to, um, that's what we did on a winter's day, is go out and sled. They'd sled on the same sort of design Nazaroff's Camden Toboggan Company handcrafts inside this Rockport workshop. But while Nazaroff might be the brains, he leaves the building to handyman Dave Reed. This day and age, everything is real fast and buy something, throw it away, and, you know. <laughs> but assuredly, that's not how it's done in this shop. Reed is meticulous. His custom toboggans are built to last a lifetime, if not more. In fact, each year, only between two and three dozen are made. Well, that's the way it's been all through my life in construction. I I build something, I'm proud of it when it's done. So, from a made in Maine perspective, stay warm, stay safe, and have fun. For Maine's Total Weather and News, I'm Steve Minnick. As the seasons begin to change, we'd like to introduce you to some of the folks behind the scenes that help us keep you informed on what to expect in your backyard. Our total weather spotters are not only a crucial part of our team, but are also an eclectic bunch. Katie Thompson introduces you to one of them. On one side of this lens, natural beauty in its purest form. Taking the pictures and sharing them with other people because they just seem to like it so much. On the other side of the lens, Steve Yanko, a hobbyist photographer from Lisbon. What makes his shutter click? The Four Seasons. Yeah, that was, like I said, two years ago. We'd get that ice storm around Christmas. Always, it seems, in the right place at the right time, like this foliage bow. Symbolic, perhaps, of that annual battle between summer and fall. I knew there was a clearing. I said, I got to get up to this clearing really quick before either it stops raining or the sun dips behind a cloud or something. His timing is no coincidence because as much as he loves capturing the weather in Maine, he loves studying it, tracking it, and reporting it even more. 
If I had to pick one, it would definitely be winter. I'm definitely a winter person. Black pot here is actually what they call a tipping bucket rain gauge. Volunteering as a trained spotter for the National Weather Service. When it comes to thriving in those long winter months, Yanko has it all figured out. I think it kind of makes the winter go by faster and you don't uh, caress every snowflake that falls from the sky. Thanks, Katie. As you can see, Steve is a volunteer at the Mount Washington Observatory. Coming up, we'll strap in and show you exactly what it takes to bring those observers to the top of the rock pile. But first, we want to know which factors are needed to achieve blizzard conditions. A, winds over 35 miles per hour. B, blowing and drifting snow. C, visibility under a quarter mile. Or D, all of the above. The answer when we come back. This is Winter in Maine, a total forecast. Before the break, we asked you which factors are needed to achieve blizzard conditions. The answer is actually D, all of the above. A blizzard actually has nothing to do with how much snow falls. And you need the wind, blowing and drifting snow, and low visibility to last over a course of three hours to make it a blizzard. It can be pretty uh, exciting, especially if you're kind of like a weather junkie like a lot of us are up here. Driving to work can be a challenge during our main winters, but for the few who work on the summit of Mount Washington, their commute can be out of this world. Last February, we showed you just how difficult it is. Here, a WMTW favorite, how the observers get to the top. Weather observer Caleb Moot remembers his first trip to the top just like it was yesterday. He's you know, fly, going towards a giant pile of snow, and I'm sitting like, he's not going to go through that, right? And then he, of course, gets right to it and just plows it through. I'm like, holy cow, these things are seriously powerful. It's an eight mile trek, and the weather can make it nearly impossible. But luckily for staff, researchers, and others who visit the Mount Washington Observatory, they have Slim Bryant at the helm. Seven years up here, probably uh, 400 trips in all types of weather. Slim has seen it all. He says on a good day, the trip takes about an hour, but on a bad day. But I've had trips that have uh, lasted uh, almost the entire day. He says the hardest and scariest part is knowing where you are. So it's always visibility, uh, blowing snow, fog, uh, everything being covered with rime ice. Really, it's a, it, at times, it's, it's almost like a uh, lost at sea type feeling. The windows ice over and then you just have no point of reference. As you get closer to the top, the visibility is almost zero, even on a good day. This is not fresh snow that's falling. This is uh, snow that is just drifting down from another location. Every time the wind changes direction, we have a storm up here. And on occasion, Slim has to rely on his passengers to lead him up the mountain. Worst case scenario, if we're doing a shift change, Everybody is dressed for uh, to be outside. They may uh, get out and walk ahead of me just so I have a color that I can follow. Um, visibility for uh, a person outside is much better than it is inside. That wind can top 100 miles per hour throughout the winter, easily picking up the snow and moving it. The drifting snow piles up and it falls to slim to keep the road clear for safe passage. Right in here, we're probably eight. Eight or ten feet above the road, yeah. um, and we got to be very careful about not uh, creating a big snow slide here, like that. The big chunks right there that came out. And I think we've only had one shift change in my five years with the observatory that uh, we've actually turned around for shift change, um, and that was because of uh, avalanche danger, basically. So why does the staff go through all this just to get to work? They actually live for these extreme conditions, and the observatory is a nonprofit organization that has kept more than 80 years of climate data, so their work is important. It can be pretty uh, exciting, especially if you're kind of like a weather junkie like a lot of us are up here. The Mount Washington Observatory is vital to the world of weather, and it keeps a dedicated crew to keep it running. And winter on the summit lasts eight months.
And if you're wondering if this winter will be like last winter, you won't want to miss our exclusive winter outlook. But first, did you know there's a specific protocol to follow when measuring snow? Many use a two by two piece of plywood in an unobstructed area. Measurements should be made every six hours to the nearest tenth of an inch. Next time it snows, give it a try. We'll be right back. You're watching Winter in Maine, a total forecast. Hey guys, over here. Each year, the Total Weather team brings weather your school to you, and the kids are so eager to learn about Maine's weather. Here's a look at this year's school visits so far. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Is this true that uh, animals know more about weather than humans? Animals have reactions to pressure drops. Thank you, Mallory, for highlighting Oxford Hills this morning. A big part of being a meteorologist is being able to communicate, getting the forecast out. Good morning. Hey, Alex. Hey, guys. Good morning. Now I'm going to teach you guys a little bit about weather. So, meteorology is a lot of fun, it's hard. But it's a lot of fun. So I always ask, what do you like? What are you interested in? If you like meteorology now, you never know. Do you get any exact measurements? So we take the exact information that we can get, and then we fall back on our education, our expertise, our, our instinct. Do you guys know what a meteorologist does? The coldest place I've been is Mount Washington. Do we have like oh, earthquakes in Maine? We do have earthquakes in Maine. They are not forecast. They're not part of meteorology. They are typically very small. So go ahead and say it. When thunder roars, go indoors. You got it. We have so much fun at our school visits. And if you would like us to come to your school, go to WMTW.com, hover over the weather tab, and click on weather at your school. So far, it's been a mild start to the winter season. But is that any indication of what winter has in store for us? Well, we've been looking at the data, and here now is our exclusive winter outlook. This winter, there looks to be two major factors which will determine what we can expect. First, there's the Arctic Oscillation, or more simply put, whether the North Pole is covered by either low or high pressure. Low pressure prevents cold air from pushing south through North America. High pressure does the opposite, allowing pieces of Arctic air to move south. These cold outbreaks can bring bouts of frigid temperatures leading to major snowstorms. This was the case last year and looks to redevelop once again this winter. But unlike last year, we have El Nino to contend with. El Nino provides added precipitation to developing storms, and if strong enough, it can push warm air right into New England. And that is the challenge this year, cold air from the north battling with warm air from the south. In the end, we're likely to see some of both. November was warm, and December will likely end up being above normal as well. With the new year will come a very stormy pattern. Snow and the possibility of an ice storm will increase as the warm and cold air collide overhead. A decent January thaw is expected, something we never saw last year, before the parade of storms continue into February. By this time, El Nino will have weakened enough so the snow and cold take the upper hand. That means February will likely be our snowiest month, along with bouts of bitter cold. And once again, major storms may bring blizzard conditions to the area. The stormy pattern will continue into March, with the cold once again lingering into early spring. That's our show for this evening. Whatever winter brings us, we hope you get a chance to get outside and enjoy it. We'd like to thank our team of Total Weather Spotters for helping us out. And remember, when winter weather hits, we're here for you on air, online, and on your smartphone and tablet so you know exactly what's headed our way. And when you're in your car, you can catch our total weather forecast on our radio partners, 94.9 WHOM and News Radio WGAN. From all of us at Maine's Total Weather and News, thank you for watching.